Uh, we will start with the most important speaker for the whole conference. And it's Peter Waters from Cambridge University. And I think I want to learn because we all want to hear you. That's all. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I did wonder what I was going to be doing in this, uh, in this talk, uh, but I must say before I start actually, what's, uh, you know, how, how good it is to be invited here, uh, and what a wonderful group of people actually, um, I think it's one of the nicest conferences I've ever been to in terms of the people, but that's probably because we all share this same passion and the same interests, which is uh, the interest for communicating science. Uh, so, so I think it's you know, really quite noticeable anyway. Um, but uh, what I was going to talk about today was some of the projects that uh, I've been involved with uh, over the past and um, some of the lessons perhaps to be learned from this. Actually, is it possible to put maybe the lights down on the, on the front? Yeah, that would be good. Um, some of the lessons that have learned from this. Uh, and uh, I think you know, maybe I could summarise this with uh, never work with children, lasers and Tesla coils. But uh, you should see why during this. But uh, okay, so some of the incidents that have happened. Um, so I think one of the important things, I mean, for uh, why uh, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing is because uh, you know, at a young age I was hooked on science, and I suspect many of the people here does the same thing. So I think then that uh, you know, the most important age group for me to try and attract into science are probably you know, around the age of eight or so. So you can get that little spark in them that then, you know, that they then carry forwards themselves uh, for the rest of their lives. I mean, that's what happened with me. It was just, you know, finding out something about sort of something about science. It's actually played with magnets, and I still don't know how they work. You know, just thought, you know, what fantastic things these are. But it's you know, from an early age, and so the lectures that I do, uh, many of the demonstration lectures are aimed at kids of about that age. But uh, they presented in such a way, I mean, there are you know, lots of you know, bangs and flashes, but there's a very strong educational message. But they're presented in a way that uh, the adults in the audience, particularly the parents, you know, will want to come along to these lectures. And they're actually secretly being educated as well. Because I think uh, this is the other key thing. It's not only the eight-year-olds that we need to educate and get hooked on science, but it's the adults that really have a very bad understanding of a lot of the science issues, of course, uh, and especially chemistry. And it's rather nice that I've had people coming up to me after some of my lectures and say, wow, you know, I hated chemistry at school and couldn't do anything of it. These are you know, sort of uh, people in their 40s, 50s or whatever. And so you know, suddenly I can see you know, why it makes some sense and you know, how it's uh, you know, really, and I've learned more in your one lecture than I did in school, which I think is very nice. So I think you know, people want to learn, but I say my lectures are generally aimed at a young audience, but uh, the, the parents uh, enjoy bringing their kids to these lectures so they are quite fun. So, anyway, so the different projects that I've been involved with. So, first of all, um, this is uh, it's a TV program for um, Discovery. Uh, so, this is a few years now, so uh, I, I'm looking you know, not as fat uh, in the things as you used to see. So, it's quite a few years ago, but it's quite fun. So, this was the idea was taking some uh, really miserable kids, okay, who had no, they were picked because they had no interest in science whatsoever. And the idea of the TV program was that they're going to be transformed and they're going to become geniuses uh, you know, after going through this, uh, these, uh, this, um, this program. Uh, so it's uh, six one hour episodes, uh, but there's a few things that I wanted to, to point out about this. So, anyway. So this is uh, This is the big experiment. Not raining. Not raining out there. So right. So um that, that explosion, by the way, that you saw, we went to a beach to do that, which was all quite fun. And uh, so they had these, uh, well, they, they were obviously experts, I mean, you wouldn't be doing that if you weren't. But uh, there was a bit of a near miss when suddenly this thing blew up when nobody was uh, sort of expecting it. And uh, uh, that, uh, was it, I think the producers were quite worried about this, that they could have killed all the kids. But anyway, right. Um, so, the first thing... Um, I think the message here is, I don't know how many people have done work with TV, but... It's, you know, they, I don't really like it in many ways because they, they want to sort of steal your ideas and because they can't do some of the things themselves. 
uh, and then you know, it's up to them how they present things. You have to be very careful. But uh, and then they try to stitch me up. They try to uh, yeah to do something rather unpleasant at one point in this, uh, pretending that we well, for one of the episodes we took. Uh, all the children into Soho, which is the red light district in London, uh, to look at the neon lights, which is all very exciting. But then they had this uh, surprise meeting that they set up with the headmaster sort of telling us off, which was completely ridiculous because, of course, there's no way we could have done this without the huge army of uh, uh, helpers and uh, childminders that were with the kids at all times. And so it was, again, just sort of presenting things in a, in a bad way. Uh, and an in inaccurate way for TV, but uh, you know, we didn't allow that. They said that this is completely unacceptable. But anyway, this, here's another little um, illustration of this. The protons and neutrons form the nucleus, which the electrons orbit. Peter has devised the practical, which he hopes will help the kids make a connection between the balls in front of them and atomic structure. I got this. How is this? It looks like a good start, as the cast seem to enjoy sticking Peter's protons and neutrons together. Actually, amazingly enough, I think they're doing really well here. They're uh, counting the number of protons, they're going up to the periodic table, they're writing down the right elements. I think this, yeah, going back, I'm very pleased. So, so this is, this is, I mean, we were trying to teach the, the syllabus for the school through this. And so I thought, well, this is quite fun. So we had wooden spheres for protons and neutrons, and we arranged magnets on the protons and just uh, uh, essentially drawing pins on the neutrons. So you know, they, could, they had to try and stick them together, and then they could read off the bits <coughs> quite clearly on the balance. They had to work out which element it was from the number of protons, and they go up to the periodic table and so on. So this is trying to give them something to do to, you know, to begin to understand the idea of uh, the structure of the atom, which is the first thing they needed to learn really. But, I mean, this actually worked quite well, um, this, this experiment, and the kids seemed to enjoy it. But the, t the TV company then um, you know, kept the cameras rolling, kept the cameras rolling, so the kids had finished, and then they got really bored, and then they kept the cameras rolling. And so what they wanted to show, what their whole aim here was, without telling us, of course, uh, was that they wanted this to be a failure, okay, uh, and then the next thing to be a great success, okay. And so this was all completely sort of engineered without uh, you know, telling us that this is what they're going to do, trying to sabotage my experiment, uh, which, as I say, I think, you know, on the whole worked pretty well. So what did they want to do instead? So they wanted uh, the, the other co-presenter, Laura, who you'll see in a moment, uh, to, you know, to do a far more exciting experiment with the kids. Anyway, so this is uh, her, which, which she didn't think of. I mean, this is you know, from the TV company. They, they, they wanted uh, this particular thing. So this is, this is their view of uh, how to teach the structure of the atom. So there's one proton that's a hydrogen atom. Experiment. <laughs> We've got two protons and two neutrons. This is helium. Lithium. Right, one more red, please. Okay, that's beryllium. Boron. So we've got six protons and two neutrons. That's carbon. That's nitrogen. Oxygen. We're making flory. So we've got ten protons and ten neutrons. Neon. It's the end. <laughs> so, is, is it about PTSD? Sorry, is it about traumatic stress disorder? So, looks all very exciting and so on. But the kids were bored, rigid for this, and I'll tell you why. Because it took so long to film. Okay. And, again, for health and safety reasons, those motorbikes, you saw it was sped up on there, but they were actually crawling along, going so slowly that one of them even fell over. <laughs> it's a great embarrassment of the big hairy bikers on it. Uh, so, but, you know, that wasn't the story that the TV people wanted to tell. They wanted boring thing in the classroom, get it out of the classroom, it's just so wild and wacky and so exciting. But as a, and the way this was filmed, actually, they did it in reverse, so they started off with you know, the lots of the kids. Uh, and then the poor guy at the end, you know, he was absolutely just sort of so sick of it. He'd been there sort of an hour, you know, waiting to film this thing. So it's, you know, the message is, you know, you sort of have to be careful with these TV companies and how they present things and so on. It's, uh, uh, anyway, so it's quite fun. But uh, I have a, a, another clip that, uh, well, it's, this, is, this is quite nice. And what element is in your balloon? Yeah. Helium. Please do not set fire to anything apart from the balloon. She's the real star of the show. Yeah, I can't see it now. But, uh, but once and then Peter's Sadie McCrone. The fun really starts. 
Now this one is dangerous, it's very tall for helium. These balloons are hydrogen balloons. I'm going to show you now then why people do not fill their party balloons with hydrogen. When it's mixed with air, hydrogen becomes incredibly volatile. I didn't write that, you know, hydrogen doesn't become volatile. <laughs> At last, Peter's got the kids' attention. Yeah, exactly. He can save his fascinators. Oh, <laughs> 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 in his biggest proposals, he'd get him in over, so one puts him on face. Boom! So, uh, yeah. No, I say Sa Sadie on there, she, she was yeah, the, the real star of the entire show, I think. But she, she was quite unpleasant, I must say. At one point, she threatened to get her sister to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we were giving a lecture. Uh, and, uh, and this isn't, so, you know, it sounds, you know, okay, I just laugh it off. But her sister was, had only just got out of prison for grievous bodily harm. So <laughs> maybe they were also here. Yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, the, these kids, I mean, it's actually really sad. So if, if the school here was an underachieving school and... Uh, it should have been a good experiment, but the problem was, I mean, all of these were picked from different classes, and they were the worst kids, that it doesn't matter what you did, they were not going to be interested in it. You know, so, it was, you know, we had all these hovercrafts coming into the school, and they were driving, and saying, no, I'm going home and play on my Xbox, in it. You know, and they just absolutely would not, you know, they did not want to do it. But occasionally, you know, there were things, there were moments when, yeah, you know, there was a little spark there, uh, and, and they did get really quite excited, uh, which is quite good. But I think, again, to, to show you, you know, how, uh, you know, how appreciative they were, there's quite a nice little experiment here. This, is quite good. this, this involves um, some giant helium balloons. So the students had to work out how many giant helium balloons they would need in order to be able to fly, okay, which is quite cool. And then uh, they did it in an experiment, okay, which, which is... Uh, in a challenge that has never been attempted before, the kids will have to work out how many giant helium balloons it will take to support their friend's weight. Too many will cause too much lift. Too few could have disastrous consequences. <laughs> okay, so that's all they have to do, and uh, this is how it went. Okay, you both feel, feel comfortable? Yeah. Yeah? Feel confident? Yeah. <laughs> it's quite interesting, so there's no um, safety net for them. Okay. As the platforms rise, there's only to stop them floating away. Uh, which is a bit of a shame, really. When he's scared, he's quiet. Oh, so <laughs> Shabazz will be the first to step off and knowing how little some of his friends have paid attention in the past week he's understandably nervous <laughs> has done nothing to calm Cherry's nerves. Uh, why is he shaking? Uh, stop moving. Just stay still. Taking the next step will be the toughest decision of her life. The 
girl's thorough calculations have paid off as Jerry floats slowly and safely to the ground. The relief of the rest of the class is obvious. <laughs> okay, so, there we go. All very exciting. Now, the question is, though, what do the kids think of this? Okay, and this is, this is the important part of this. All right? So this is them interviewed afterwards, what they thought of the experiment. I thought it was right. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't really exciting. Because we weren't doing it. Yeah, because we weren't really doing it. It was absolutely boring. <laughs> Wait, all this time, this I favorite. always did with flew with helium balloons on them. That's my favourite quote, yes. <laughs> we waited all this time, and all they did was just fly with helium balloons. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, and, and, but, I mean, the message here is, it's because they weren't actually doing this, that, you know, it doesn't matter how exciting these things are, you know, the kids really like to do the stuff themselves. And so for the ones actually involved, yeah, it's quite fun. But for all these others who were just simply watching there, they were absolutely bored, mm. of course. But that's, uh, you know, again, not how they wanted to present it. So all that, you know, all their classmates are really worried. Well, they weren't worried at all. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, in the, the script afterwards and how it's all presented. Anyway, so it was, it was quite a fun, fun series in some ways. But uh, let's say there were other things that uh, yeah, were, were less fun. But uh, I think one of my favourite experiments was uh, they were mixing up um, some, uh, uh, it was basically Harold Dite, and they had to sort of, you know, work out the best proportions to mix the two ingredients, and then they glued one of their friends, and they were suspended uh, you know, quite high up uh, near the Tower Bridge, which was quite fun, and then they, they dropped and so on. And that was quite exciting, because one of them fainted at some point, so I was going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did the kids actually learn from all this? Uh, so, so they were doing calculations and things in the classroom. So but they were actually doing Basic the calculations. Basic math for, for science. Exactly. Yeah. So and the lift from the balloons and so on. So they did all this with, with smaller balloons earlier in the process. So I haven't shown all that, but uh, yeah. But they did actually have to take uh, the normal national exam at the end of this, and they took it. I don't know. It was maybe two years earlier than they would normally do. And I, I mean, to be honest, uh, so one of the girls on there, um, she got the top grade that she could, uh, which was you know, really you know, the highest grade possible. Uh, and that was, that was actually quite an achievement. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it was, there were some good things out of it. Uh, but it was, it was all just, as I say, it was just, I didn't, what I didn't like was how it was manipulated by the producers and directors, really, behind the scenes, sort of thing, trying to portray it in a different way. Uh, but, yeah. It was, it was okay. I mean, so actually, I mean, I think really the kids were completely neutral, more or less all the way through. There were times when they were very, very excited and really enjoyed it. But on the whole, they were sort of pretty neutral. But the way it came across on TV, they were sort of you know, not interested to start off with and then really excited towards the end. But that was not necessarily quite how it was. But, it's all about editing. Uh, sorry? It's all about editing. It's all in the editing, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so... One of the other things that I'm involved with is the uh, Cambridge Science Festival. This is, of course, you know, the same sort of thing that uh, you're, you're all doing uh, all around the world, um, sort of demonstration lectures. And uh, I just wanted, I mean, this is just a couple of little clips uh, from things that I wanted to show here. Uh, I have over here this um, a phosphorescent <laughs> sheet. To finish this one. Now, the moment it being protected from the light with a cover. So, the light's off, please. So this is from a lecture about light, okay. and we're going to do something similar after after this uh, talk, anyway. So I, I won't play all sheets here. Now this is material that, when it's exposed to light, will glow in the dark. So if anyone with a laser pointer can please shine their light on this. Ah, oh, very good. Some of them are nearly hitting it. Yes. <laughs> very good. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop. On this one, because as I say, uh, we will look at this one later. Um, but uh, so in this, this is a lecture on light. I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to give you know, all the audience, they can have, uh, you know, all the responsible adults, they can have a little you know, key ring laser. Oh, last time, never do that again. <laughs> so this is one of my take home messages never, never give your audience lasers. So we were filming this thing, <laughs> but yeah, there are lasers in my eyes and lasers on my groin, you know, so they have to edit all that out. So, yeah, so don't do it, okay? It's, just, it's, it's not worth it. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, 
actually, so one of the experiments that I wanted to do was to set off the finale, have a big explosion, but to do this by, they had to get their lasers and uh, onto a target, and when a certain number of lasers were on the target, then it would set off this explosion. But actually, what, the thing you didn't realise, of course, is when you have so many laser dots, you have no idea which one's your laser dot, <laughs> and so you, you, you can't do it, it's absolutely impossible. So it's, it's quite fun, but very hard. You have to sort of, you know, you sort of get your laser, and then you move it across, and you have to keep track of it and, and, and follow which one it is, otherwise you've got no chance at all. So it was a you know, learning experience, I think, is the best way to put that. But uh, sort of quite fun, but uh, I won't be giving the audience lasers anymore. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you is uh, one from a lecture about air. Uh, you, you, I'll be wearing a, a very snazzy lab coat that somebody made for me. The, um, the different colours on it show the different proportions of the gases in the air. So the main uh, body is uh, nitrogen yellow, and then the sleeves, I think, are blue for the oxygen, and the pocket is the argon, which is red, and the bottom is the carbon dioxide. I don't know. So just in we want case to look at the <laughs> chemical properties of carbon dioxide, and one of the properties is that it's heavier than air. Now, I've got a bucket full of carbon dioxide here. I'm just going to pick up this bucket, being very careful not to spill any, and I'm going to pour some of this into the bucket here. Now, see if you can see what happens. Now, I'm pouring it now. Can you see it coming out? No. It's invisible. But look what's happening to the bucket. Okay, so that's because the carbon dioxide is heavier than air. But the reason I wanted to show that is because you know, it's such a simple experiment, and sometimes it's these really, really simple ones that can really get the kids excited. And so, I mean, it didn't quite pick up on the audio there, but yeah, they really love this. There's a huge round of applause and you know, cheering and so on. And I, thought, and I wasn't expecting that, because you just think, oh, it's just, you know, just carbon dioxide, just heavier than air. But you know, it's just the surprise in these young kids that you know, it, was, it was really nice. So that was one of, one of, the, one of, the, one of the demonstrations. But I think another one that I was really surprised at was uh, explaining the Avogadro number during a lecture once. And, and uh, so we did it in terms of, you know, there's, uh, you know, how many grains of rice are there in this bag, and then having a huge sack, and then how many sacks you need to give every person in the world, and then you need to take each grain and divide it, and so on. And so sort of, you know, gradually talking them through, trying to get them to understand how big this number is, because it's you know, an impossibly large number that doesn't mean anything. But, you know, at the end of this, again, you know, there's this sort of round of applause, and it's just, it's, it was, I felt really pleased that that was one of the sort of nicest things, because it's, a, it's, just, a, it's just a number, and you're trying to explain this, and the fact that uh, kids can get excited about this when it's presented in a way, nice way is, is, is quite fun. Right, uh, anyway, so where are we going now? Um, I think, yeah, so I thought I'd say a few things about the, uh, the Christmas lectures. So this, uh, these are at the Royal Institution uh, in London, and they were set up in 1825 by Michael Faraday. So here he is. So he was on our £20 note for a long period of time. And uh, here he is lecturing in this very famous lecture theatre at the Royal Institution. Uh, so they happen once a year at Christmas time. Uh, and, well, I mean, so now the tradition is you, you, know, you do it once and that's it. So I, I was really pleased uh, to be asked in 2012 uh, to give a series of lectures. So you give uh, three, three lectures uh, and they're televised. Uh, so it's quite fun. So this is the first time for a while that they've had chemistry. When they were asking me to write a, a proposal for this, they said they wanted it on the elements. I thought, well, you know, how are you going to do the elements in, in three lectures? How can you sort of split them up? I, mean, you know, so I was trying to think, well, what could I do? So in the end, I went with um, the theme of um, the sort of the Greek elements, uh, which is a bit inconvenient because, of course, there were four. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, sort of fitting the modern elements into that theme of uh, um, air, earth and water, and fire being a common theme to all of the lectures, because there were lots of explosions and things. Uh, so that was quite fun. So um, I was going to talk about a few of the little uh, demonstrations that we did there. So I mean, as, you know, as I say, it's a great honour to, to be asked to do this. Uh, and you know, in the past, you know, apart from Michael Faraday and so on, and Bragg, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins has done it, Carl Sagan's given it, and so on. So it's, you know, it's, a, so it's quite a, a nice thing. Um, I don't think, I don't know if this is... Actually, going to work. Oh, this is the intro that they gave for the day, which is quite nice. So with 
with this, uh, I mean, I mean, it would have taken years to put together. In fact, it did, in a sense, take years because many of the lectures that I've been giving uh, for science festivals and so on, so they you know, have different themes and so on. And so yeah, it takes a long time to, to perfect these demonstrations, as you will all know. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a lot of this I had already prepared, in a sense. And so, but uh, there were new things that we did as well. Um, and uh, it was quite fun because there were sort of you know, excuses to try things that I've never normally done. And so this is one of them. This is one of the things I was, I was really pleased with. Um, and it's an experiment I've always wanted to, to do, and this is to burn a diamond in air. And uh, so if you look on YouTube, uh, it, it, there's demonstrations of people doing it in liquid oxygen. I thought, well, I don't want to do it in liquid oxygen, uh, because you know, kids aren't going to understand what liquid oxygen is. I mean, you know, it's a weird thing. It's very cold, and it's, you know, and it, it's sort of not something they will have come across. So I wanted to do it just in, in oxygen gas. So I designed this apparatus. Um, so we have, uh, there's a diamond on it, there's a close-up in a minute. Uh, there's uh, a tube, you know, oxygen flowing through this, just pure oxygen. So we had a um, little uh, jet of hydrogen uh, ignited by a, a sparker. So we have the oxygen flowing through, then turn on the hydrogen with it you know, clicking, and then the, the thing lights. Uh, I was a bit worried because uh, I managed to electrocute myself with this uh, sparker, uh, and my <coughs> technician electrocuted himself. And then to, we thought to, to actually help out with the experiment uh, you know, live, as it were, uh, during the lecture, we would get uh, Sir Harry Croteau, uh, who uh, got the Nobel Prize, of course, for discovering Buckminster Fullery. So he, he was coming down to help out, and I was petrified that he was going to get electrocuted by this thing during it as well, and that would be it, and then I would have killed you know, the Nobel Prize winning scientist. But uh, <laughs> fortunately, uh, it, was, it was all okay. So the, we had the flame going onto the, onto the diamond itself. So this is a hydrogen uh, flame. And the other thing I wanted to do, I wanted to, you know, the, one of the reasons I've never done this before is because it was a real diamond, it was, uh, you know, flawed, so it wasn't a high quality, it looked good to me, I mean, it, 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 we'd, we'd had a little gag that uh, it was taken from his wife's uh, engagement, thing. So, so he brought down the ring and we prized the diamond out and put it into the thing, which is all quite fun. Um, so then, you know, putting the hydrogen onto this, but I wanted to show, you know, because this is the sort of classic thing that, you know, really carbon, uh, diamond is made of carbon, so I wanted to show that, uh, you know, it turns, the product turns lime water milky, okay, so, you know, this is all part of it, and which, again, you couldn't do if you were doing it easily uh, with the liquid oxygen method. So, this is why we were using the hydrogen flame playing onto it, so the only product there was water. But one of the things that I wasn't expecting, um, and this is a close-up, one of the things that I wasn't expecting uh, when we were you know, going through this and practicing with graphite and so on rather than diamonds was that uh, you, know, you, you can actually just switch the flame off and this thing will carry on, uh, the reaction carries on. Um, and so this is it, so there's no hydrogen flame on here. All that is is a glowing diamond and this is really very exciting. So there's no flames coming off of it because of course this is not volatile in any way. And so all the, this, this diamond just sits there and it just glows like a little star and it looks yeah, absolutely beautiful. I was really, you know, really, really pleased. Uh, so, a nice piece of apparatus. So, designed all this, and, and you know, I was just, just over the moon when it actually worked. You know, this is, I think, you know, when I get excited about sort of science. And here is our lime water, and it did indeed go, go milky. And I thought, you know, it was just so nice. So, it's sort of a nice thing. So, this is you know, still you know, obviously available on YouTube and whatever. And so, you know, a lot of teachers use this, which is rather nice. Um, one of the other experiments, I don't think I've got a picture of it, that uh, I'd always wanted to do was um, in the periodic table, you know, you have the most reactive metal, which is cesium, you see this with water, well, that's, you know, that's, that's easy. Uh, but then there's fluorine, the most reactive non-metal. And I thought, wow, you know, surely everyone wants to see what happens when these two come together. So that was quite fun. So in, in the lecture on the water, when we were looking at the salts in water, uh, we had uh, you know, cesium reacting with fluorine. So this is quite fun. So I had to go and find a fluorine specialist, because there's very, very few people. I mean, so even in you know, our chemistry labs and most chemistry labs, nobody ever <coughs> uses fluorine itself. And it's very difficult to make. It's, you, know, you have to have a special apparatus for doing this. Really horrid stuff. So I found a fluorine specialist. Uh, it was quite funny, though, because you know, I had never seen fluorine ever. Uh, he had, though, had never seen cesium, so this is quite exciting. So the two of us came together, me bringing my cesium, him with his, uh, with his fluorine, and we designed a nice piece of apparatus so we could, again, do this live in the, in the, uh, in the lecture theatre, uh, you know, using fluorine and using cesium. So had a very thin tube filled with a little bit of fluorine and sort of blew that over the cesium, and then there was a reaction. It was, it was quite fun, uh, but uh, you know, it was a nice thing, and, and as far as I could tell, it hadn't really been done or at least recorded before, so, so that was quite exciting. 
So the Christmas lectures were giving me a chance to sort of try a few things that just because they were quite so difficult, you know, I would never be able to do them sort of lots of times. Uh, so it's sort of more of a one-off. And one of the other things that I always have wanted to do, and so this gave me an excuse to do this, is to, to play with some gold bars, you know, because uh, yeah, they're just so exciting, you know, having to pick up a gold bar. Um, and so we wanted to balance a child with their weight in gold. And this was actually, so this was in the, in the Earth's lecture, when we were looking at matches and ores and so on. Um, but this was, it was also ties in with bonding. Um, so actually, I don't have a picture of it, which is a shame. Uh, we had a, a nice bonding machine uh, that, um, that models how electrons uh, help to bond atoms together, uh, but then pull atoms apart. So uh, it was all with pulleys and things. So you have sort of two atoms, sort of, you know, two, two big spheres that are moved together. Um, as you put the electrons in, the ele electrons are heavy weights, and you put them in between, and they pu literally pull them together. But then there are a, 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 a given number of slots to put these heavy electrons in, and after that they had to go outside, and then this pulled the atoms apart. And so actually it was, I thought, quite a... And it had a lot of technicians and teachers writing in to say, oh, what a fantastic model, and we will be using this, and where can I get one? Uh, but so, so it really nicely showed how, I say, electrons can first of all help to hold atoms together, but then uh, pull them apart. And so this is, you know, we were gradually explaining why the bonds get stronger uh, as you go across the periodic table and then get weaker until with the noble gases, there's no, there are no bonds at all between them. So this was a sort of a continuation of this. You know, why are certain metals quite so dense? Because of course, I mean, we've got gold, uh, we've got osmium in the center of the transition metals. But then as you keep on going after that, the atoms are getting heavier. So an atom of lead is heavier than an atom of osmium. But then why is it then that the osmium is so much more dense? And of course it's because of the packing and, the, and how they're bonding, and so and that itself is to do with the number of electrons that are available to help stick the atoms together. And then as you keep on going, they're, they're pulling each other apart, and so the bonds get weaker until you get to a gas again right at the end. So this is quite nice. So we were looking at why gold is quite so dense. And this, this idea of, you know, that it really is quite striking that uh, you know, so we had these, go these are real gold bars managed to, we persuaded somebody to lend us the gold, which is very nice. Um, but of course, you know, they do this thing that, uh, you know, if, if you, these, these, this is the correct way to store a gold bar. They're these, they have these cross section, uh, sort of, you know, looking like that. But of course, most people in all the films, you see them the other way up. And then, you know, that seems to be the natural way to put them, the other way up. And then you can't actually pick them up with one hand. So often, you know, if the Bank of England is feeling sort of, you know, sort of uh, uh, quite lucky, it says, you know, if you can pick it up, you can have it with one hand. And then you just can't do it, because you can't get a grip on this. So this was quite fun. But, so we had this big balance made, and they you know, worked out how much gold was needed. Uh, and it was a bit of a, again, it was a bit of a fudge, because we were a little bit of gold short. And so we had to ask the audience if anyone had some gold on them. And uh, so this is how we introduced Harry Croto when he puts his hand up and says, well, I've got this uh, Nobel Prize here, would that do? And so, yeah, so we finished balance the Bob with the Nobel Prize, which was, which was you know, really corny, but it was, it was so nice. It was, yeah. But what was really fun, actually, because when I asked uh, Harry Croto if, if, if we could do this, if he could borrow his Nobel Prize and he could come on and help out, um, he, he, he'd lost it. So actually, because he, he's put it somewhere safe in his house, and he, he's, he's quite uh, absent-minded, it has to be said, and he'd sort of, you know, put it somewhere safe, and uh, actually had lost it, so he's been <laughs> ages trying to find where he'd safely put his, he'd put his Nobel Prize, but anyway, so that was quite fun, but it was, you know, it was a nice demonstration. But, so this meant that then I had this big balance, and uh, we wanted to go around uh, the UK, and actually we went to Japan and to uh, Singapore, um, with, with a version of the, of the lecture series, which was quite nice. Um, but, so yeah, I, I still wanted to use this balance to show this, this incredible density of some of the metals. And so I actually had uh, some tungsten blocks made that were the same dimensions as the, the gold bars here. And so yeah, they were quite expensive. I mean, it was a few thousand pounds to have these things made. But, I mean, the nice thing is that, you know, the audience can come up and, you know, pick these things up. And so, you know, they, this, this is the thing that really makes the connection with kids, when they can feel for themselves, you know, just how dense this thing is. So, I mean, I mean maybe you're familiar with uh, Oliver Sacks' book, uh, Uncle Tungsten. And he says, you know, this, the striking thing there was, you know, his, his, his uncle worked in a tungsten factory, and it made such a huge impression on him, picking up, you know, a relatively small block of tungsten, but it's just so dense, you know, density of 18 point whatever, and it's just not something that you normally come across. And so, in a say, you know, so we had these tungsten blocks made, they were quite expensive, but 
know, you can do the whole, can you pick it up with one hand, and they can't. And, you know, people and kids are really quite excited. Even the grumpy, miserable teenagers, you know, they're going like, hmm, that's quite heavy, isn't it? Yeah, even, the, even the grumpy ones are sort of, you know, sort of, you know, quite surprised by this, which is quite fun, which is nice. So we can't do it with gold all the time, but you know, we can do pretty much exactly the same thing with tungsten. And of course, tungsten is even used to, to fake gold bars. So apparently, even in Fort Knox, they found gold bars with tungsten rods inserted into them uh, because it has uh, just about the same density. So it's one of the few things that you can actually use to, to forge a gold bar. So it's, it's a nice, nice model. Uh, yeah, here are the, the gold bars there. And uh, this was uh, one of the other things. So, yes, this is, as I say, never work with Tesla coils. Um, I have to be careful when I say Tesla coil, because apparently one of my friends was up in the, the, the audience there, and there's this little old lady who says, why does he keep talking about his giant testicle? <laughs> <laughs> ever since then, now I, I'm paranoid and have to say, Tesla coil. Yeah, so, it's, anyway, um, so, yeah, so here's this giant thing. So when I was you know, designing the lectures, I thought, like, okay, this is one of the things I want to do, because it's just so awesome. Even though you know, perhaps you could say this is more physics uh, than chemistry, but uh, what, we're, what we're trying to show here, we were, this is in the first lecture about uh, the gases in the air. And we were looking at nitrogen and oxygen and so on, and different properties of them and different mixtures and so on. But uh, this is you know, one of the ways that you can actually get nitrogen to combine, uh, to react uh, by, in nature when it reacts with oxygen uh, during a thunderstorm. So yeah, we have this uh, fantastic lightning, and the noise of this I mean, is absolutely incredible. And then you can smell well it's a mixture of nitrogen dioxide uh, from the reactions that go on in ozone, of course. But it, you know, there is a noticeable smell there. But... I mean, this thing, so we, I wanted to have this so it could lower down, you know, like sort of Frankenstein style, coming down from the ceiling, which was great. So it came down, we had to do this. But the problem was, I mean, this thing really did have, it, it does have a mind of its own, this Tesla coil. So when we were practicing this, uh, you know, in, in, previously a few, few weeks before, um, all the alarms went off in, in the building. Oh, that's a bit strange. Yeah, yeah, and then we found out that the alarm was actually in the basement, so we thought, okay, clearly it's not us. You know. But then it started controlling the, the guy's phone who was filming it on his, on his camera phone. It started sort of doing weird things and resetting everything. Yeah. Um, and so then during another rehearsal uh, during the day, again, the alarm went off. Um, and uh, we were not popular then because there was a very important meeting taking place and the whole building had to get evacuated. <laughs> and it was still apparently registering in the basement. And so then we thought, well, maybe it is us then, since this is you know, twice in a row. Um, and all of the lights and the lecture theatre get flashing and they couldn't switch it off. Yeah, it was amazing. So we've taken this to different locations around the UK, and everywhere we go, it does something different. Okay, it's really cool. Uh, so we gave it in a school. Uh, they had this huge sort of Victorian stage, which was fantastic. They had this fantastic clock, and it just stopped the clock. And it's never worked again. So, that's quite exciting. so, so they remember when we went there, which is good. And in other places, it you know, switch lights on and whatever, and they say we can't switch them off now, and so it's, it's great. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. The, the, and the, well, the difficulties it caused, I mean, so when we were filming this, uh, so there are these little cameras on here. These were looking at the audience, and the audience were holding up periodic table cards and forming a periodic table, which was all quite fun. Uh, but so it shut these cameras down. They just went, and just shut down like this, uh, as soon as you switched it on. And the, the camera crew were absolutely petrified. They were, um, so in the end, I mean, it was, it was almost touch and go whether we were going to be able to do this, which I really want to do, because, I mean, it is absolutely awesome. I mean, the noise it makes, and it's you know, really exciting uh, and, you know, to have these huge sparks coming down in the audience, which is great. But it nearly didn't happen, and this was because... You know, the, the Royal Institution would not take responsibility for this. Uh, they were paranoid and somebody, you know, somebody had a pacemaker, they were going to die. Uh, they were paranoid that all of the, the million pounds worth of camera equipment that was being used to film all of this was going to get uh, destroyed. And so in the end, the, it was very brave of the, the owner of the production company. He said, well, you know, we've got to do this and you know, we're just going to do it. And so that's it. You know, so he took personal responsibility for this, which was quite remarkable. Uh, and you know, it was more or less fine on the night. So they took most of the cameras away that uh, were not absolutely <coughs> crucial, and they had the other cameras on it. Uh, but still, there's um, a chap in the, uh, in the two floors up who was editing this. He was sort of more or less editing, editing it as, as it uh, goes along. 
because there's a very short turnaround time. But apparently during using this, it suddenly changed all of his uh, equipment, changed the language into Polish. <laughs> so it, was, it, it really is, it, it really does have quite a mind of its own, which is, which is quite fun. So, and you never quite know what it's going to do. But it, it, it sort of, you know, it was great and it worked and it didn't destroy anything irreversibly. So, apart from the lights and the lecture theatre, which they had to fix afterwards. But anyway, so it was, it was, it was good. Um, and uh, where are we? So yeah, these are the uh, some of the cards that I, I was talking about um, in the audience. And this was a rather unfortunate uh, picture. Uh, so we were talking about radioactive decay. Okay? So this is this is all very very innocent. So we were talking about how you know so one atom, the nucleus loses. It's uh, an alpha particle, and it moves two spaces along. And so you know, so you're going from rain on there to polonium, then you're going on to lead. And so the, the, the photographer just caught this picture of these kids spelling out porn. But, uh, but there we go. Uh, yes. uh, with uh, Mrs. Mrs. Croto not looking very, uh, very impressed. With this, but, uh, anyway, so no, it, was, it was quite funny. It was, it was, yeah. Anyway, so... Um, where are we? So, uh, so this is, uh, I say, one of the other things that I'm involved with. Uh, then something that uh, actually, I mean, probably the reason that I'm here, uh, that uh, with uh, working with other people here, uh, is through the chemistry of Impia. Uh, and I thought I'd say a few things about this, um, since you know, it's part of what I do. Um, so this is, for those of you that don't know, um, takes place in, in most of the, all the sciences, so physics, maths, chemistry, biology, astronomy, informatics, all sorts of things. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's a really, really worthwhile thing. Um, so this is when we had it uh, in, in the UK. Um, so I think it's closer to getting on to 80 countries now for, for chemistry, but more in physics and more in maths, and even more in maths, which has been going the longest, I think. Um, so this is, I think, it's a very worthwhile thing. Um, so for those of you that don't know, in this, uh, sort of for chemistry, um, this poor, poor students, well, the students are selected through a national competition. So they have um, their own written papers within their, their, their home countries. Um, and they select the students uh, to participate, a team of four. Um, and they're, they're uh, competing individually rather than with teams. And so they go abroad, they have 10 days, which is great for the kids, so very sort of you know, social things. They get to sort of see the, the country that they're visiting. But they'd have a five-hour theory paper uh, and a, a five-hour practical paper. Um, so they actually have to do uh, a practical exam, which is, which is all quite fun. Um, and uh, so the, the mentors that are accompanying them, uh, I say we're, we're some of us are mentors in the Olympiad, um, uh, they have to do all the work, so translating it. So this is not an exam that's taken in English, it's taken in their, their own languages, because it's only on their ability to do the, the, the subject, the science or whatever, which is very good. Uh, and of course, let's say it's, a, it's a great chance for the students to go and do lots of social things. So here they are going out and uh, doing fun things with a castle and so on and coming back and get absolutely exhausted at the end of the day um, and uh, this is one of our teams before so I was going to say a little bit about uh, the UK side of things um, so why I think these are really important the, these competitions is it's another way to get kids excited about chemistry so the demonstration lectures are fine and I think they're very good for particularly young kids getting that little spark there but then the, well, the question is, well, what do you do for these you know, older kids? Yes, yeah, they can enjoy demonstration lectures and so on. But unfortunately, I mean, the exams that they have to sit in the UK, at least, the A-levels, um, they're not very exciting. And uh, the chemistry ones certainly uh, are not particularly challenging in many ways for the really good students. And so, you know, it's certainly felt that uh, some of the better students... Uh, will tend to pick other, other subjects because they don't think chemistry was particularly hard or interesting or whatever. And so you know, what we're trying to do in our national competition, yes, I mean, there's this small aim of trying to find the four students to represent the UK, but I mean, really, we're trying to promote chemistry in the, in the country, uh, even for kids that are you know, not, not going to be in the, the top few at all. So we try to do things that uh, are a little bit more interesting in, in the first paper. And this goes round, I mean, there's about sort of six or 7,000 students sitting this the exam. So we try to do questions that are sort of relevant. So this one was looking about uh, the space shuttle and the, uh, the, uh, the fuel, uh, the solid rocket boosters that use uh, aluminium and ammonium chlorate, and then there's hydrogen and oxygen in the, in the main tank and so on. Uh, what else have we got? This one is looking at pollution in the Taj Mahal and uh, looking at how it's uh, dissolving it and so on, and what we do to prevent it. Uh, catalytic converters, 
uh, and you know, how they work. And this is uh, a diesel one, actually, which is quite exciting. Uh, in diesel catalytic uh, converters, they have a lot of particles, uh, particulates, and they over-oxidize it, so they have a lot of nitrogen oxides left over, and so then this is to used, ammonia is used to reduce it back down again. So it's, it's a lot of sort of yeah, interesting chemistry, but put in a, a context that they can relate to. Uh, this, this is quite fun. This is... Um, we were looking at, uh, you know, when the oxygen masks come down on planes, they, they don't use cylinders of oxygen gas, it's chemically generated. So this is from the decomposition of uh, sodium chlorate and having particles of iron in there and it's an exothermic reaction that, uh, that keeps it going. So this was looking at you know, the, the chemistry and how much you need and so on. And so we found all the data out and so on, which was all quite fun. So... But it's, it, the interesting thing was trying to word it in a nice way that, uh, you know, you say that uh, it, uh, how much oxygen do you need before your plane reaches a nice safe altitude? So this is what it was doing here. And so they were yeah, looking at that, which is all quite clever. Uh, this was why your urine smells if you eat asparagus. Uh, I, I'm sure you've noticed, uh, but it's, it's the chemistry involved with that. And this is you know, going back to the original papers and trying to find out and so on. So it's you know, all you know, sort of interesting things. Uh, this was this was a nice uh, a, 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 a question um, that uh, a lot of teachers come back to me and say, oh, they, they really really like this. This was uh, a, a molecule that was na uh, made a few years ago by James Tor in the um, in the in the states. So he sent us a sample of this, which was very nice, and we run uh, a 700 megahertz uh, uh, proton NMR spectrum. And the kids can actually we picked this particular molecule because of the symmetry in it. It's actually relatively easy to understand the carbon NMR spectrum and then the proton NMR spectrum. And the kids can just about sort of work it out, which is, which is quite nice. So but we you know, needed a really nice high-res one to be able to do this. The same group, so he made all these molecules just because they look like little people, uh, which is you know, amazing how he managed to get a grant for it, but there we go. Um, uh, but it made a lot, of, you know, a lot of publicity from it, which is, which is quite exciting. He also did uh, these ones. This is this nano car. And now this is actually quite clever because uh, this has um, wheels that only turn in one direction, and they're driven by light. Uh, which is quite exciting. So there's a, a mechanism here that this can only turn in one particular direction, and it's due to a sort of a, a bond uh, isomerism there. But again, it was, it was quite fun getting the kids to work out, you know, which way this car goes, depending on the wheels, how they're attached, and so on, or whatever. So that was, it was quite fun. Uh, this is a question that was about um, supernova. Uh, so the NASA website is, of course, absolutely fantastic, as I'm sure you, know, you will all be using all the images you can use, as long as you just say that they're from NASA. Uh, and so uh, you can find all sorts of fantastic things there. This is, again, it, it's something that you can get the kids to do for themselves. This is, they can work out what element is in this supernova just from the frequency of the light that's coming back to Earth. And this is because they're one electron systems, so incredibly simple maths. Uh, so this is, well, this in astronomy speak is oxygen 7 plus, so just one remaining electron, and uh, neon 9 plus. But I say from the, from the wavelengths themselves, they can work out and uh, work out what the transitions are and so on. So that's quite nice. Uh, what else? This was uh, in the news. So what we're trying to do here, these are questions that are sort of in the news uh, and sort of quite exciting things. We're trying to translate this science from the, I mean, the papers themselves will be utterly inaccessible to the students. And so the job here is to try and translate this into something that they can do for themselves. And this was one that I was, I was particularly pleased about. This was um, a Dutch team uh, who were looking at this Van Hoch painting, if that's the right way to say it. I, I, I should ask. Yes, oh, okay, some nods, that's good. Uh, so this is called a patch of grass. And hidden under this painting is this, this old lady, so she's not normally visible like that, of course. And they're using this technique, uh, looking at the particular um, uh, wavelengths of the radiation coming off um, to work out what, not only what elements there are, um, but also what oxidation state these elements are in. And so this means that they can actually work out what the pigments are, because they're sort of yeah, pretty well-known pigments. So for instance, the lips here, uh, this is from cinnabar, from mercury sulfide. So because they're detecting mercury and sulfur in that region, then they know that it's mercury sulfide, and they know that it's this, this red pigment. So they can actually get this, this huge uh, detail of the, uh, you know, even the, the pigments that were used uh, you know, underneath this grass. Uh, so it's, it's quite exciting. But I say, getting this into a state where the students themselves can actually do this and, and calculate these things is, is pretty good. All of these questions, by the way, are available on the Royal Society of Chemistry website. Uh, so all, all the questions are there if anyone's interested in these papers. Uh, this is, uh, we, we told them how to synthesize uh, rohypnol. 
uh, which is a bit controversial, perhaps. But the kids, you know, the exciting thing is this, that the kids come out of this and go, I can't believe that they told us how to make rohypnol. I mean, there's no way they could make this drug, I mean, because the synthesis is actually technically very hard, and they wouldn't be able to get the ingredients, including cyanide, for instance. But the fact that they're you know, excited enough to talk about it afterwards to their mates is, is quite exciting, I think. This was, a, this was, this was a really interesting thing, actually. This was a drug a few years ago that was going to solve all problems of obesity and uh, addiction. So apparently, if you have this, you, you stop wanting to you know, drink too much alcohol, you stop wanting to smoke, stop wanting to eat. But apparently it was then withdrawn because you just stopped wanting to live. And, uh, <laughs> so there was an increased uh, rise of suicide, apparently, on people that are taking it. So it, it came and went, this drug. But uh, anyway, so it was quite nice at the time when we were looking at the synthesis. Uh, this was uh, the synthesis of Viagra. Uh, again, another one that the uh, kids were very excited about. Uh, but there's no picture because uh, we couldn't get a picture actually we asked Pfizer you know can we have a you know, photograph to put on here or maybe the pills and said, well no we can't do that we can't be encouraging you know, its use uh, you know in a non-medical way and all this sort of stuff so in the end we thought okay well, we'll just put a uh, sensor on it so that's why that was Tamiflu so again in the news for bird flu and this is the synthesis of this so it's quite a tricky synthesis but again can be presented in a way that the students can understand Lipitor the biggest selling drug in the world, uh, that was you know, quite fun. So that's uh, so some of the things from the um, Chemistry Olympiad. And finally, what I was going to say a few words about was this other thing we set up, the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge, because uh, there's a few interesting ideas from here. Um, this is uh, in two parts. Uh, one is a written paper that the students <coughs> sit in their exams, and this is um, the year, the year, well, before they decide what they want to do at university. And so the Olympiad in, in the UK is certainly generally taken by students in their final year. They've already you know, chosen what they want to do at university. Um, this one is a year before. So we wanted to do something similar, um, so have some interesting questions, but they need to be at a lower level that the students can, can tackle. So again, we're trying to get some interesting things that maybe are in the news. Um, so this was from uh, the 2013 paper. This was uh, just discovered uh, this oldest sample of water. Uh, which, is, which is all quite exciting, um, discovered uh, in, in Canada. Um, and um, this was, uh, you know, so the students managed to work out how old this is to actually do the calculation themselves. And it's actually quite complicated. They spent a long time going through the paper with this and actually again contacting the original author and he was you know, trying to work it out with me because he was having problems as well. But eventually we managed to get this into a form that the students could understand. And it was exciting because you know, bacteria thought to sort of you know, be able to, uh, you know, might be present in this water that's 2.4 million years old or uh, is it billion or whatever. Yeah, two, oh, whatever. Uh, very old, yes. So quite old. Um, and uh, so this was on last year's paper, we're looking at the James Webb Telescope. Uh, of course this is using uh, beryllium here, um, and because uh, it's very hard and low thermal expansion or something like this, so it's, um, which is why it's used very light, uh, the lightest uh, metal that you can have up there safely. Uh, so they were doing some simple calculations with this, and this, does anyone know what this is from? Oh, I, I thought this audience would know. So this is from uh, the film Galaxy Quest. I don't know if you've seen this. So this is what uh, power. So this Galaxy Quest is a fantastic film that I can recommend uh, to you. It's a sort of uh, sort of a gentle, respectful play on Star Trek, uh, but it's about these aliens that uh, are, are receiving the TV signals uh, from this this uh, TV. Uh, 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 sci-fi program called Galaxy Quest, and the aliens build a replica of the spaceship that actually works, and so they, they make everything actually work, and it's all very exciting. But their ship is powered by um, a beryllium sphere, so this is what this thing is. But of course, you know, as I'm sure you, you, know, you will know what Star Trek uses, did you know what Star Trek uses to power their spaceships? Well, well, maybe, or I don't know, but I thought they used dilith crystal. dilithium crystals, exactly. And so the interesting thing is dilithium crystals. You can't get dilithium crystals, but you can get dilithium. And so one of the things that we were looking at at the end of this question was uh, the bonding in the dilithium crystals, and then why you can't get beryllium-2 molecules. You can get Li-2 molecules, but you can't, well, they're very, very uh, incredibly weak bonding. And again, this is this anti-bonding effect of the electrons there, which is quite exciting. So it's sort of beginning to get quite tricky uh, chemistry, but it's presented in a way that can be understood. Uh, this was from 2013. This was, uh, you may remember, in the UK, at least, we were paranoid about uh, eating horse meat. 
uh, because it had been detected in minute quantities in uh, things like uh, beef burgers and uh, beef lasagna and so on. There were traces of uh, horse meat. And so the worry was, because uh, this drug uh, was used uh, for anti-inflammatory in, in horses, um, and it was used to be used in humans, but it's been banned. Um, and so there's this, you know, unsafe for humans and the fact that it's got this drug in. So they were looking at the synthesis of this and looking at uh, how to detect this. And, of course, again, the media throws this out of all proportion. Um, and uh, so we thought, well, okay, yeah, we'll do a calculation. How many burgers, so these were the correct levels that have been detected, how many burgers would you need to eat in order to get the medicinal dose of this, this compound when it was used in medicine? And it came out to be 250,000 burgers you know, in one go. So you know, it, it, this is never mentioned in the media, of course. They never, it's just all scaremongering from chemistry. So there's a sort of serious message there. One of the other ones we did was uh, on homeopathy a few years earlier. Uh, and they, they had to work out how, how much uh, of this uh, uh, homeopathic remedy, an arsenic remedy, they would need to drink in order to have uh, a lethal dose of arsenic. And uh, they had to express their answer in volumes of the earth. And it came out to be something like 2,000 times the volume of the earth in order to have you know, <coughs> the dose. Bottle has memory. So oh, exactly. Has memory. Well, then, they, then they had to work out how many bottles you'd need to drink in order to have a 50-50 chance of having one atom. And again, it's you know, millions of bottles of, of the stuff. Uh, it's just you know, all nonsense. Yes, so it's a good job it has memory. Yes. Um, anyway. Uh, oh, yes, yes. This on the top here. Uh, so this, uh, when this compound, uh, phenolbutazone, is, uh, is metabolized in the body, it's uh, converted into this more soluble form, oxyphenbutazone. But, as I'm, this is a good top tip for you, this is the highest possible word score in Scrabble. Okay? So, and, uh, and so uh, on, uh, on, I think it's on Wikipedia or somewhere, there is a link to this to show how it can be played. Now, there's, there's a few strange words in this. Um, uh, I, that, that's wakeners. I, I have to keep misreading that every time I see this. But so down the side here, so they've got so all this has been set up, and they're showing right from the beginning how this, how you can end up doing this. And so this is your hand. So this is these are the letters that you've got. And you've been well, what can I do with this? And there we go. So down here, oxyphenbutazone just fits in, uh, and it all fits in perfectly. And it scores something like a couple of thousand points in Scrabble. So, so there's a top tip for you there. If you ever you know, can spell that, you're, you're going to win, basically. Yes. Uh, but there we go. All the words. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is the thing. So I don't know what was going on here, why we had to have that, but there we go. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, this is this is this is this is interesting. So. The paper that we're sitting here, um, so that we sit for our um, year 12 students, so let's say one more year at school to go, it's, it's, a tr it's a challenging paper. So the students find it really difficult because it's not in the same format as their, their national exams that they have to do. Um, so the questions are different. So in their A-levels, I mean, so students, I've, I've had students come to Cambridge and say that uh, they found it really stressful at Cambridge because whereas at school, he would go into the exam and know that he'd basically done all of these questions before. Maybe there's tiny little variations, but he'd seen every type of question that they could possibly ask. But you know, when you get to university, as we all know, the questions are not like that, and it is, you, know, you begin, have to begin to think for yourselves. So this is what we're trying to encourage in these papers. Uh, and we make them difficult. They are challenging, but they are actually doable. So they, the teacher can take them through them later, but they do find it a real challenge because it's not in the same sort of format and so, actually, the sort of uh, the modal mark here comes out to be around sort of uh, 14, 15 out of 60. Okay. So, and we get uh, feedback saying, "Oh, my students are all going to get the top grades in their national exams in their A levels, and yet they're only scoring marks around here." And we say, "Well, look, these are the skills that you really need to try to. That they can do this. There's nothing in this paper that the students are not able to do." It's because they can't see how to do this yet, and this is the sort of thing that you should be encouraging. So this is, as I say, it's for sort of you know, older students just before they get into university, but it's something to keep, you know, to keep them in, engaged, show that science is relevant, but also that it uh, you know, uh, can be you know, an interesting challenge as well. But the top students, as you see up here, are getting almost full marks. 
Um, for those of you that aren't chemists, uh, I shall point out uh, you know, that in group 11 of the periodic table, there's copper at the top, there's silver at the bottom, and then there's gold underneath that, and then underneath that is the, the, one of the newer elements that's only been discovered relatively recently in just a few atoms, and this is the element runt genium. So this is, these are our top, top, top awards, and these ones here we invite to uh, a training camp uh, in, in, in Cambridge for a few days, a residential camp, and that's really great fun. So we've got all these really bright kids, uh, and they can do some demonstration practicals and lectures and so on, so they, they seem to enjoy that. And so this is uh, feedback uh, from one of the teachers. And they're just sort of saying that they really appreciate this, uh, having just another resource. And again, all of this is available um, on, the, uh, on the website. All of these questions are there, and anyone can steal any of them, use them, whatever you want to do with them if you want them. Uh, um, so that's quite a nice thing. Website? So uh, it's, uh, well, you can search for the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge, or it's, the website is uh, c 3 l 6 Com. So this is the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge, that's the C3 bit, and the L6 is the year at school that we primarily aim it at, which is the lower sixth. Uh, and we liked it because it looked like a chemical formula. But, um, so, oh, there are, C3L6.com. Um, so that's one side of this competition, the written paper, trying to get some, something interesting but challenging. But then the other thing that we set up, this was um, something, a web-based competition that students all around the world can participate in. And the idea here is what we wanted to try to do was to find those students out there that have this passion um, for them to be able to identify themselves to us. Uh, and so, well, I mean, it, it was initially quite successful when it started off a few years ago. Numbers participating have died down a bit. I mean, it's a few hundred every month. But we put um, five questions online on, on one minute, one second past midnight on the first of the month. And the idea is that these have to be um, questions that they can solve using the internet, because of course you know, all kids are just going to instantly look up the answer on the internet, but they have to be Google-proof questions, so you can't literally type in the question into Google and get the answer. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is the synthesis of Rajenim, as it turns out, uh, from, this, uh, from the Russian scientist here. Uh, but so these are some of the different questions that have been used. So this is, this is all they will see, okay? And so uh, they have to you know, work out what the question's about, uh, and try and find out the answer. So this was, uh, well, this is uh, the Big Bang, uh, but this is uh, how, um, how much energy you can get from the binding energy when uh, four alpha particles, four helium nuclei are forming uh, oxygen-16, how much energy is released. Um, this, is, uh, this is false gold iron pyrites uh, that they had to identify. This is looking at uh, phenol failing, which uh, is an indicator using chemistry colorless in uh, dilute acid. Uh, this beautiful pink color, which they recognize, but they might not know that it goes this beautiful orange in, in very strong massive, which is quite interesting. Uh, this is uh, Boltzmann, Boltzmann's tomb, uh, his equation there, so this is uh, where he's buried. Uh, this was looking at these porphyrins, so these are present in, in blood with an iron atom in the middle, uh, in chlorophyll with a magnesium atom, and in the pigment uh, in there with uh, a copper atom, so they had to identify the elements there. So these are some of the uh, <coughs> students have entered from all different countries all around the world. Uh, so it's quite fun. Though if they, you know, if they do, as soon as they've solved the five questions, they move from one question to the next question, uh, they're getting so harder each time, and when they finish them, their name can appear on this honours board. So it's a competition to see who can solve the five questions the quickest. And it always seems to be the same chap from, um, uh, from Bangladesh who seems to win, which is very nice. I mean, it's great. Now, I've been in contact with him, and he's just so excited about chemistry. But unfortunately, it's really quite sad because his parents didn't let him do the science that he wanted to do. He uh, had to go into a different area and so on. But he's, he's got this real passion for, for, uh, for chemistry. He said that he's always wanted to do it. So it's, it's quite nice to, to get people from all around the world with this. Uh, so these, we, we, um, the prizes, and I was going to pass these around. These are quite cool. So these are something that we had, had made. Uh, so these are nice little, um, uh, you know, the crystals, when you get things like the Eiffel Tower um, in, in, uh, you know, engraved with a laser, um, I'll, I'll pass these, pass them, pass them around. But what they actually are, um, these are yeah, atomic orbitals, so these show the electron distribution function uh, of uh, a hydrogen atom in various excited states. So I mean, I've never seen these in a, in a 3D version. So you know, when I saw a little Eiffel Tower in one of these crystals, I thought, like, oh, this is exciting. Maybe we could do electron distribution functions. <laughs> and uh, so we did all the calculations, sent them off to this uh, company that makes them. 
they thought, what the hell is this? It's just a load of dots. Uh, but, and then they've, they've, I mean, we've had loads of these made. We send them to every school that participates. And again, I mean, the teachers are saying, wow, this is a really fantastic teaching aid. Uh, yeah, so so they, they, they like these. And these are also the prizes that the students get. Uh, so here they are all around the world with their, with their uh, precious orbital, uh, like that. So this is uh, one that we to give to some of the other ones. Uh, and there we go, and that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to say. But I have a, a demonstration. So, um, I mean, the thing about my, my demonstration lectures, they are there's a lot of demonstrations in them. And actually, with chemistry, uh, I mean, it, it takes quite a long time to set up. So, you know, we came here just after eight this morning and only just had time to set up one demonstration. But it's uh, quite a fun little thing. Um, so we're going to try this in a moment. Uh, I don't know when it's going to work. It might work, it might not work. It's, it's sometimes a bit temperamental, so we shall see. But um, So this is from a uh, lecture that I give on light. And uh, I also have, if anyone is interested, um, some, somewhere or other, uh, a load of DVDs from some of the different lectures. So if anyone wants to, to take any of those, uh, feel free. Uh, I'll just leave them there. So there's a number of different lectures that uh, I'll give on. You know, there's a strong theme throughout all of these things. But this, this, this demonstration I'm going to do is from uh, the uh, lecture on the light. Okay. Um, and this is where it was, it was touched on in the, in the lecture that you saw earlier. And so I need some volunteers, actually. I need... Uh, uh, a very tall volunteer. Kuba. Kuba. Kuba is a very tall volunteer. Good. And I need a, a, a shorter volunteer. Shorter. 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 Okay. So somebody else. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I need. So is there anyone? Anyone shorter still? You. You'll, you'll be fine. Is there a shorter? Even shorter. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. Yes. That's good. Yeah. Good. And we need one. So we need to arrange yourself in terms of height. Okay, so whatever the way is, it doesn't good. matter, however, however you want. Okay. okay, now we need somebody in between, somebody in between. I think we need a girl for this as, as well. Yeah. Between yeah. 1 meter 75 and yeah. so, so somewhere two meters. Somewhere in between here. 170. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, oh, well, never mind. No, oh, you, did you volunteer? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we've got to go around. Okay, right. Well, sorry, you've been replaced. You, you, I've been replaced. <laughs> <laughs> Right, good. Okay. Now, so, I mean, this is just a bit, uh, a bit of fun. So I normally do this with the, with the kids, of course. And um, what this is about, I mean, it, it's looking at um, the wavelengths of light and the energies of, of light and, and, and different colours, different energies and so on. So we have uh, different coloured lasers here. So where are we? We need... Uh, so, uh, you, the longest... Wait, so you get a red laser. Don't look at see, this is what everyone does. They just turn on their eyes. It doesn't matter you, exactly. You tell them this, and the first thing they do is you have uh, yellow. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, you have green. Okay. And you have violet. Okay. So up. So just to test them for me on the phone. Lovely, marvelous. Right. And uh, so over here, I have. Um, so this is what we were doing in the lecture with uh, basically some phosphorescent sheet. And I normally do this on a, on a big one or have uh, somebody come up. So first of all, if you have the red laser on this, okay, all over, yeah, so nothing happens. Okay, right, okay, let's try yellow. So we're increasing the energy, of course, and this is what you'll be talking about and you know, showing relevant slides and so on. Uh, nothing there, okay, let's try green. Nothing there, and then finally the violet one. Whoa. Okay, and this is this is quite nice. So this is it's not because the laser is uh, higher power, because of course there's plenty of demonstrations when it's just because it's a high power laser. It doesn't matter what color it is, the little bursting. That is quite nice because you can show complementary colors and so on and all those sorts of things. But I mean, what we're trying to show here is that there's an increase in the energy of the photons with colour, okay? And that it goes, the longest wavelength is, of course, the lowest energy. So this is quite fun. So when you get a really little kid out, he's very excited that he's the powerful one <laughs> uh, with, with the uh, laser that can do the exciting things. Okay, so now we've established then that uh, this one has the highest energy. We're going to try another experiment, and uh, I think it might be, might be good for people sitting here just to clear over that way, just stand over there for a moment, because uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you might get hit by something, if it works, okay? uh, it, it comes out quite fast, right, so this is, actually I'll move my laptop as well, I think. Okay, as I say, make me, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay, it might be quite painful if you're hit, okay? No problem, okay. Right. So, this is a mixture of uh, hydrogen and chlorine, okay? And I, I'm trying to, to, to aim this approximately as a... Uh, you're, you're, you're probably in the most dangerous position, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I hope that this will be okay. Like, well, yeah, you, know, you never know. Right. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So the tube here. Yeah, we'll right. we'll that's back over there is going to go. For. You reckon. Uh -huh. Right. So the tube here is filled with a mixture of hydrogen and chlorine. Okay. And so what we're going to do is going to try the different lasers in order. Uh, on this, okay? So, uh, this is actually a silica tube, um, and so I'm using silica because it's uh, not going to be absorbing so much of the, of the light. So if we come over, over this way, uh, all the lasers, and we're going to start off, first of all, with our red. So you come here, come here, <laughs> this way. Okay. Yeah, you do it from here, so, okay? So, and now there's a little window in the middle there, okay? So you have to aim your laser on the little window. This may work, it may not work, you know, no idea. Okay, it depends, because it's been a while, it's been sitting there for some time. Okay, that's probably not going to work. Okay, let's go, go to next, next <laughs> energy. So this is yellow. Very nicely lasered, but, yeah. but no good. Okay, <laughs> let's go to green. Let's try the violet one. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Violet? <laughs> the wild. The violet. Violet. Uh, maybe go a bit closer. Try a bit closer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, it might, might be tricky because it's, uh, if it's, if it's, it hasn't gone down. There's another over there. Yeah, it's. Uh, but just, I do have a spare one, which I might get out of here. <laughs> 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 A mixture of hydrogen and chlorine. So, let me give you a little nasty. <laughs> a mixture of hydrogen and chlorine. And the reaction will take in place there. I mean, the, the blue light, the violet light, has enough energy to, to separate the chlorine atoms and the molecules. And that then starts a chain reaction. So, but it's only the blue light that is able to do this. Again, it's not the power of the laser, it's the, the energy of the photons. So, and the, one of the nice things is when I first gave my when I first gave the light lecture, um, and this was maybe about ten years ago. Um, I had the only blue laser pen in the UK at the time, and it cost several hundred pounds. But this laser here uh, is now I think uh, you can buy them for three pounds. Uh, uh, this is because these are the ones that are used in uh, in Blu-ray DVDs. So you know, really, really cheap. But it, it makes a you know, nice striking demonstration of you know, the energies of light, I think. So, anyway, there we go. That's, that's more. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, yeah. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so, this, uh, so, this is the same sort of thing you, you can buy. This is phosphorescent paper. Um, and so, the night, because it's giving out a nice green light. You need to have higher energy than green yeah. in order to get it to progress. So yeah, it, it's, you, you can. I mean, I have reels and reels of this, so lots of it's uh, quite uh, quite nice. It's it's actually um, what is it? Uh, strontium aluminate, yttrium-based strontium. No, europium doped strontium aluminate. That's what uh, the, the active uh, uh, pigment is there. Uh, well, I mean, I, I contacted the manufacturers uh, for this because they gave me, you know, meters of it, which is which is great. Because then uh, you can do, uh, you can get the kids to sort of pose on on uh, against a sheet of it, and then shine a nice bright light, and then then they get their picture on it. It's really nice. And actually, a normal flash will work. Uh, yeah, we can use a, a. Well, you need to check in advance which sort of light bulbs you're going to use. I mean, it needs to have sufficient energy. energy to put, um, yeah, some of them work, some of them not so good. But uh, yeah, but it's quite nice. And one of the experiments that actually we did with the grumpy kids uh, that uh, were never excited by anything. But one experiment that really got them very excited. We have a, a huge room with all this uh, sheet of paper going all the way around, and we used uh, it was a magnesium flash. So it was uh, the sort of thing that you use in photography. Uh, they used to use you know, Victorian times. 
We walk, so this was done in a theatre in London, and we said, it's going to make some smoke. And they go, oh, no problem, we, we can do this. And I said, no, it's going to make a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke. Anyway, so we did this, and, and there's tons and tons of smoke, uh, and the alarms went off, and they, get, they come back, and they say, what have you done? You know, what did you do? Anyway, but it's quite exciting, the smoke billowing out of the doors. But the kids were really, really excited, because they had this, and they were all doing these poses all around, all the class, and that was one of the few things but they came out afterwards and said, wow, that's the best thing we've ever done. So that was quite nice. So it's nice to get a good reaction at some point from them. Any other questions about anything? Yeah. And Peter, Peter? Yeah. You're a poster. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, actually, yeah. I'll show you this. Cut the lights up for a second. So this, Light. the lights at the back, or these lights or whatever, uh, so we can see. So this, this poster, actually, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. No. So this is to on, advertise... On, on. on. No, 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 off. Off. It's on, on. We have it on. on. <laughs> yeah. Set off the first. Did I? Okay, right. Um, Okie dokie. So, uh, maps. so this is, uh, so we sent this to every school in the UK. And uh, so it's about the flame test. So this is something the kids need to know. But we wanted to do a poster that was advertising our competition, but was going to stay on the walls, okay? So, okay, I mean, it's quite a nice poster, and it shows we actually made these, so these are, you know, these are not fake things, these are real flames. And so they're you know, soaked in the salts of the particular elements, and then we, we actually videoed the, uh, the flames themselves. But the fun thing is, it uses a, a, an app here oh. where they, they come alive. And so I mean, it's, it's quite good. Yeah, exactly. So is it still on? Yes, so I can have my hand here, and you can see the handle there, but uh, it's, and then you can uh, tap on them and get a bit more information, and it, it starts speaking to you, and it's turning up, so, and it's uh, showing their line spectrum, so, so they can do this on their apps, uh, on, on their phones, and so on, and what's, what's, what's nice, I mean, so when we sent these out, um, teachers were writing back saying, wow, the kids are so excited by this, they're all blocking the corridors looking at this poster, and, and we still get in requests, so this was several years ago, uh, we did this, and people are still say, our poster's worn out now, because we take it from you know, room to room to use in the classroom, and so on. But uh, so that they are saying, can you send us more copies? And so we're still sending these out. Well, almost every week we send out one to school somewhere, which, which is quite nice. But again, it's just a little bit of fun uh, you know, on, on something that would otherwise be a little bit boring. But the, these apps are, are, are quite clever things. So this is a collaboration with um, somebody from the engineering department at our university that was working on this augmented reality. So it's uh, quite nice. So thank you for I have some of these places if anyone wants to take them home. Yeah, if anyone wants a poster, I have a, a few here. Uh, if, if anyone wants to take one. Yeah, there's not that many. But there's that, that one there.